there we go. I'll speak a little bit about what BIO is. If you are not here as a member of Biographers International Organization, I would please ask you to consider checking out our website, biographersinternational.org, and look at some of the membership options, as well as a little bit more about what BIO does. I will share a little bit now. So BIO is a nonprofit that aims to promote the art and craft of biography while cultivating a diverse community of biographers, encouraging public interest in biography, and providing educational and fellowship opportunities that support the work of biographers worldwide. And as a small plug, our roster of fellowships are now open for submissions. That's another good reason to check out the website. There's quite a few of those. Um, this is one such event that we like to hold to educate the community. So as I have mentioned, we are joined by Frances Wilson, author of Burning Man, for those who are still joining. I will be here off to the side admitting people. The conversation will go about 40 minutes. We want to reserve about 20 minutes for questions. I would ask that everybody who is not a speaker, please stay on mute for the duration and type your questions into the chat box. I will then relay those to Francis and Nigel as time permits, but this allows both the focus and the video screen to stay on them for the recording period now and when this ends up on our website. So without further ado, Nigel, I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Holly. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'm really honored to uh, be talking today with Frances Wilson about her prize-winning biography of uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, D.H. Lawrence. And it, um, it's, the subtitle is The Trials of D.H. Lawrence. Um, I, I the, the committee who were reviewing uh, almost 200 biographies really felt that this was the most outstanding biography, really the most, uh, certainly I feel this is probably one of the most original biographies I've ever read. And, <laughs> and that comes from the heart. And I have, as I say, read quite a few biographies in my time. I just loved it. I um, spent most of my biographical life writing about uh, 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 presidents and generals and, and action men, if you like. And I, I think I'm so envious, Francis, that you were able to write it in, in a kind of warlike, dramatic way, <laughs> the story of D.H. Lawrence and uh, his travels and his marriage. And but you've put it in uh, such a fascinating context, this Dante context. So I wondered if we could start by, if you could tell us how you came to that idea and perhaps explain a little of it to, to those who are looking at the book. Thank you, thank you. Well, the, um, the book, as you say, it's in the, it, I've structured the biography around, the, around Dante's Divine Comedy and so it's three books. The biography is composed of three books, which I can originally thought might stand as independent books. The first one is called Inferno. The middle book is called Purgatory. And the final book is, um, is called Paradise. And this arose, this structure arose very organically because when I started to read Lawrence deeply, I kept coming across these references to the Inferno. And it was not necessarily Dante's Inferno. He just kept talking about his life as an Inferno. And this started with it, the way he was describing his childhood in Eastwood, the Nottingham Miningshire village he was born and brought up in. Where, and he talked about his, his father and all the men in Eastwood were going down to the Inferno every day, that miners, went underground. And then I realized, of course, that for Lawrence, you know, he'd never met a man who didn't go underground during the day. I mean, all of his friends' fathers worked underground. It was only his teacher and his priest who didn't go underground, but they talked about the underground world all the time. And then realized that uh, Lawrence continued using this image when he went on to describe his life in England during the First World War. Over and over again in letters, he said, please get me out of this inferno. It is hell here in the underworld. And then <laughs> I thought, God, he's actually conceiving 
of the first part of his life as being this kind of um, this Dante-esque inferno experience. And what he was talking about during the war years was uh, the burning of his first important novel, The Rainbow. And when, this was in 1915. The Rainbow was his great, big, bold, beautiful novel, as he described it. And it was censored. Uh, it was censored and by the magistrates in Bow Street Court. And 1,011 copies were publicly burnt by a hangman on the streets of London. And then, at, at which point, Lawrence's Inferno imagery got more and more and more dramatic. And then he described himself as completely trapped in England during the war. He'd fallen out violently with his country. And then after the war, he starts to use this imagery all the time of purgatory, that he's released from, um, released from this um, dark, oppressive underworld of this tight England that he can no longer bear. And he's released into Italy and he starts describing his life as purgatorial, which is exactly what, what Ezra Pound said about um, the whole of the, um, the, the whole of the, uh, the Western world after the First World War. He said the whole world was in purgatory. After the, third, um, after the First World War. And then Lawrence started talking about America as paradise. He had to get to America. And his poems about America are all about reaching paradise. And, uh, and when he got there, of course, when he got to America, because he's Lawrence, he, he fell out with the country violently. But um, it struck me that um, there was something very curious going on with this imagery. It was as though Lawrence had um, consciously shaped his life around Dante's Inferno. And why wouldn't he? Because con Lawrence saw himself as a mythical figure. Lawrence thought in symbols. Lawrence genuinely saw himself as a Christ figure. He identified profoundly with Dante because Dante was also um, an exiled poet who wrote in the vernacular. And so he, these identifications I think were very strong for him. And Lawrence saw his life as a work of art. He said, um, um, uh, uh, Art for my sake, mm. art for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided that the best way of approaching Lawrence's <laughs> life was to take him on his own terms. If well, this is how I you there, Francis, because um, uh, people will read the, the story you tell, but um, I think this is a chance for us to, to hear you uh, perhaps talk about um, how you came, I mean, you've told us how you, you you came to the sort of idea of tackling, after all, there have been thousands of, I don't know, thousands, but many, many books about D.H. Lawrence. What, to me, was so original was was this concept you had of putting it in that uh, Dante-esque context. But you also, what to me is so wonderful about the book is that you take it upon yourself, which is part of the species of biography, I think, uh, of being our guide. You, you, in telling us this extraordinary story of an artist <laughs> whose life is his art as, as well as his work, um, you, you're not above uh, arguing with uh, pre previous authors or critics or whatever. You, you are the guide our guide for for D. H. Lawrence through these circles of hell, if you like, and um, tell us a bit more about that. How, your author's voice, if you like, how you came to that. Well, I think that um, you'll know this as a biographer. All biographers know this: that you have to change your voice with every book. Mm -hmm. Now, novelists tend to be novelists tend to be able to grow their voice, and so the voice matures with each novel. But I think with biographers, you have to kind of reinvent your voice because you're having a conversation with the person you're writing about. Mm -hmm. And in order to have a conversation with Lawrence, it took me a long time to find the right voice because I didn't want to have an argument with him. <laughs> and Lawrence really only liked arguing. No, I'm going to listen to him. And so the, um, the, the voice as guide grew very organically. And I think, again, it was the Dante-esque motif 
you know, that I was, I was guiding the reader through these, um, through these circles of hell mm. and, um, and purgatory and paradise. And I wanted to, I, I wanted to foreground Lawrence's voice. I think that was the most important mm. thing me that I want I wanted the reader to hear him because I, I I felt very strongly that we everyone's heard of Lawrence and no one has read him because <laughs> the only thing the only Lawrence that anyone has read have been the novels and they're not even all the novels just a few of the novels mm. when Lawrence's I think Lawrence's most radical most interesting voice resides in all the writing that's just been forgotten and all the writing in the writing in the peripheries and so I wanted to kind of, uh, I wanted to show that um, Lawrence has this very, very complicated, rich, multivalent voice. And so bring that to the fore. Of right. the and so well, again, that was difficult. With my, I needed to keep my voice back. I don't think you did keep your voice back, but I, <laughs> I love that. I, I think biographers should do more in uh, inserting themselves openly rather than simply by implication as the narrator of a story. But um, I, I mean, I felt you were fortunate in that if you were going to take uh, Lawrence through his circles of hell, he, he's also a, a great traveler. At, at one point, I think you call him a, the first drifter. <laughs> I think he, you know, he, he goes from from England to Italy, he 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 goes he has extraordinary adventures with people, and to me, the the wonder of the book, as I say, I, I'm used to dealing with with actions, but to me, the wonder of the book is in these relationships, uh, such tortuous relationships he has with people, and in. In amongst all that, right from the very beginning, like you say, it, it starts with the trial of, of the, the rainbow, but right from the beginning, uh, Frida, his wife, is is almost the, you know, it's almost like a dual biography. She's there <laughs> in every scene. Uh, tell us more about Frida and your Frida. feelings, if you like, about Frida. Well, it has to be a dual biography, as you said, because um, Frida was never not there with Lawrence. From the moment he met her, Frida was a, in 1912, she was a permanent presence. And dealing with Lawrence and Frida reminded me of having a friend whose partner you don't like, but you always <laughs> have to have them to dinner together. You always have to go on holiday with both of them. You know, you love him, you hate her, but you know, they, um, they're a Laurel and Hardy duo. They come together and I thought, right, I'm gonna have to put up with Frida. I can't pretend she's not in the room with him because he wouldn't be in the room unless she was there because he, people described him as disappearing without Frida's presence. His need of her mm. was, was so powerful and I actually really started to like her and but none of none of Lawrence's friends did like her and that was that was important to take on board they felt she was um you know they said she was vulgar she sat with her legs wide open she smoked in his, his face when he was tubercular you know she was she was ill-educated and raucous and all of and all of these things but the important um thing is that Lawrence adored her and she was Lawrence's muse. And if Lawrence believed in the body, it was Frida's body he was believing in. And when he described Frida as being mindless, that was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I think uh, all the way through the book, you, you know, it's, it's, it's constantly surprising. You know, there's nothing predictable about it because in a sense, she's a wild woman. I mean, she's having, sex with almost everybody she meets and and he is having to to deal with this and to me another wondrous part of the book uh, is is the way you look at his sexuality because we uh, we live today obviously in 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 a culture and a time when uh, gender roles and 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 people's sexuality is absolutely front and foremost in in our concerns and um legally as well as uh, psychologically in, in, and and this is a literary example uh slightly before our time so in, in that sense they are rather 
pioneers. And I, I mean, there are some, there are some set pieces in the book, which just, <laughs> they're not necessarily more than two or three pages, but they just um, stunned me. And I mean, like the, the day he goes to Cambridge to see E.M. Forster, just tell us that story. And, and meets uh, Lord Keynes or John Lee. Yes, so, um, so Lawrence, the son of a miner, is invited to Cambridge University by, um, by Bertrand Russell to sit at high table. And Bertrand Russell has boasted to all of his academic friends that he's met an, an authentic man, that he's met a properly uneducated man who has a brilliant mind. And um, so he wants to show Lawrence off because they're all socialists. He wants to show Lawrence off as kind of his, um, um, as his discovery. And Lawrence, who has never, he's never been in an institution like Cambridge University, few of us have. So he's very, very nervous about it. And when he arrives, He's seated in this candlelit dinner, imagine kind of Hogwarts Hall or something, and Lawrence sitting at, um, at high table, having a conversation about um, the, um, higher mathematics and philosophy and holding his own really, really well and privately mocking. He did very good impersonations of all the, um, of all the Oxford Dons afterwards. And then after dinner, he goes to, um, he goes to the room of, um, of Keynes with, with Russell, of Maynard Keynes with, with Bertrand Russell. And Keynes isn't anywhere to be seen. It's a suite of rooms, so it's a kind of living room with a bedroom coming off it, and Keynes isn't anywhere to be seen. And then Keynes's um, bedroom door opens, and Keynes comes out looking quite sleepy and wearing his pajamas. At which point, Lawrence has a complete meltdown, and he describes himself as going, as sinking into a madness from which she will never, ever, recover and he, I think he I mean he loses it he goes home he falls into a coma of misery and he writes letters about his madness and he said well, what did you see what did you see because Lawrence never describes exactly what it was that kind of um, um that affected him so deeply and it's obviously something to do with homosexuality mm. that um, he suddenly realized that Keynes had a homosexual life and um, of course, Lawrence knew about homosexuality. He'd written, you know, he'd, he, he'd written novels in which beautiful young men kind of wash, each and, wash and dry each other's backs after swimming and things. So it was, very, it was very odd that he remembered this as his first completely traumatic experience. Hello. Hello, <laughs> you dog. Sorry. <laughs> he remembers this as his first his traumatic experience of homosexuality. But Everything about this scene is interesting because of what Lawrence says he knows and what Lawrence says he doesn't know. Mm. Of course, Lawrence was um, Lawrence was homosexual. We kind of know this. Yeah. You know, he was um, he was incredibly interested in um, in male sexuality. He was really only interested in male sexuality. His understanding of female sexuality, which I would say was profound, came of talking to Frida about, mm. about um, women's bodies and what women want. And Frida was a kind of liberated woman. But what interested him, what he found erotically fascinating was the male. And so part of Lawrence's kind of incredibly conflicted, and everything about Lawrence was conflict. And the one of the important things I found in writing about him is never to try and resolve those conflicts because they weren't resolved in him. Lawrence was both profoundly homophobic and homosexual at the same yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, no, to me that that that's the the marvel of the book that you you yourself are not. I mean, I think possibly too many biographers do try to come down on one side or another, and you allow. Lawrence to be this very I mean you you quote him being having self one and self two well he probably had more than those two and yeah. you know you bring out the the complexity of his relationships I mean the one you know when when rereading the book um since I read it for the prize you know I was when I read it for the prize I thought that the part about um uh, Norman Douglas and and Morris Maurice, um, Maurice Magnus. Ma 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 was was um, 
was slightly long, but when I reread it in terms of this question mark about his uh, his divided feelings about men and and homosexuality, I think it's it's a it's an absolutely fascinating part of that. Uh, I'm not sure if it was purgatory at that point or the inferno, but I think it's purgatory. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I I do think that. Um, the, the the fact that the, the book takes us on this journey to different cultures, uh, you know, it's, the, the, um, it, it it both illustrates uh, D. H. Lawrence's wonderful ability to describe landscape and places, but you know, it 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 allows uh, us to to read a very varied story. I mean, they, they these are hugely different cultures and just going back to the English culture and his uh, concern about uh, um, the snobbery being a minor's son I mean that to me again we live in a society today where people are very conscious of, uh, and, uh, about class and and those divisions that uh, people impose in their lives and their, their uh, communities, and um, I, I, I feel that, in that sense, he's he's an an escape artist. Really, he's he's always trying to get away from the fact that people are looking down their noses in him in, in England. And you, um, you you have a wonderful scene. I was just looking for it, but I couldn't find it. Perhaps you can remind me where they there is a sort of a luncheon party, and he. he that his friends give for him and then he gets drunk and vomits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, yes. So let's... Um, and, he, and people say he's not a gentleman. You know, it's, yes, yes. So um, the, the phrase about him not being a gentleman uh, uh, was um, implied when, when the Cambridge Dons were talking about Lawrence's visit. And one of the Dons said, Oh, he's the first real man I've ever met, which is a very funny description of Lawrence because he's an extremely high voice and yes. no muscle at all and was, be was very kind of um, very camp and feline. So he wasn't a real man at all in that sense. But what they meant was he's not a gentleman. Mm. He's not a gentleman. And I think um, it's absolutely vital to remember that every... In every stage of Lawrence's life, he had to deal with snobbery. And I didn't think that Lawrence's earlier biographers had taken this on board sufficiently. The kind of snobbery that the snobbery that was around in um, in England, in Edwardian England, was staggering and stifling. And Lawrence was the Lawrence was the first working class novelist. And this is what um, what his editors wanted him to write about. They wanted him to not write kind of middle class novels, which are the novels he started writing initially were middle class novels in the kind of pastoral a little bit like Thomas Hardy they wanted him to write sons and lovers they wanted to write they wanted him to describe what it was like being inside a collier's cottage and then he turned himself into this um working class hero Birkin he put Birkin the mansplainer of the century and so but Lawrence wanted to escape from mm. being working class in his novels. But um, his editors wanted to kind of pin him down as a working class novelist. And one escape he found was through Frida because Frida was an aristocrat. And Lawrence loved that, you know, that Frida's father was a baron mm. and had airs and graces. And Frida's rudeness, she was a fantastically rude woman, um, what, um, was her um, bohemian, aristocracy and so at the same time as being um very very proud a proud son of a working miner Lawrence was also the proud husband of, <laughs> of a baroness which I think is quite a gay thing <laughs> but, yeah <laughs> um but the snobbery with which people um um spoke to Lawrence. There's a wonderful description of him by David Garnett where he said Lawrence was um um a mongrel amongst Pomeranians and Alsatians. A mongrel amongst Pomeranians and Alsatians. He said he had a vulgar nose and he was like a plumber's mate. This is how I <laughs> saw Lawrence. Uh, well, I, 
uh, um, you, you, you deal with that so well. And it is such an important aspect of Lawrence that if, if one didn't come, and it, I think it helps that you're an English author, <laughs> that you're sensitive to that. And whereas um, somebody else might not be. Um, what about the business, if we're talking about escapism, of his, his fantasies of communities, of, of kind of free love communities? Uh, because again, that's uh, you know that's in our culture today the the notion that we could somehow uh, you know if not make America great again we could f find a sort of perfect community. Um, yeah. But in his case, he seems to have been completely serious about that. Yes, yes. So this is um, this fantasy was um, born in 1915 when the rainbow was first um, banned. Ro um, Lawrence um, wanted to set up a community called Ranarmin, Ran Armin, and it was going to be run by him and it was going to be <laughs> equals except that he would be the leader. And he wanted it to be in Florida initially. Um, they would all fly out to Florida and everyone would live off the land. And I think probably a bit naked <laughs> and and it would be free love and whatever and he asked literally everyone he met to join him so you you'd talk to you'd be talking to Lawrence and 10 minutes later he'd be saying come and join me in Renarmin because he didn't know anyone and so he had to make his community very quickly and no nobody came nobody came no one was interested in giving up absolutely everything for Lawrence except Frida who followed Lawrence around the world while he tried to set up this ideal community but the community um, got more and more and more kind of absurd as Lawrence's messianic notions mm. grew that in the end he wanted people he he was Christ and they were his disciples yeah he, 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 was, he, he, was he was impossible to live with you say at one point or quote. he was impossible yeah he became completely impossible and it was because he was dying and um you know, people are angry when they're always angry when they're dying. And yeah. so uh, Lawrence was trying to um, trying to live very, very, very intensively. And, um, and I didn't know how, mu how much longer he had to go. But you cannot underestimate how much Lawrence hated the modern world. Mm. When he traveled, he was time traveling. He was trying to get back to uh, uh, he was trying to get back to um, the world before civilization. So he idealized med the medieval way of life. Mm. You know, he idealized kind of sort of he idealized cavemen. You know, he wanted, and his view of um, medieval life was um, um, men and women um, without brains. He thought Renaissance had destroyed a human being because the, the Renaissance had ushered in self consciousness. So he hated Renaissance art because everyone was looking at themselves being looked at and there was too much intelligence going on in the head. He liked simple medieval art because it was just square bodies plowing and that kind of thing. So he was um, in, in his whole life was an escape from the brain and into the life of the body. The big irony being that mm. his body was killing him. And so yes. of all the Laurentian contradictions, that's the maddest one. He believed that we should listen to the intelligence of the body, but his body was saying from, you know, the age of five or six, you are dying of tuberculosis. And he didn't listen to it. He always said he had a cold, never that he had, that he was consumptive. Yeah. I mean, do you have a view on, because you have somebody quite early in the book uh, noticing that he's coughing blood into a handkerchief. Yes. And I mean, how come... And later in the book, you say that he was resisting until I think he was told by a doctor um, uh, that uh, he he was tubercular, but he resisted that um, um, diagnosis all those years. How is that possible? Well, he did it by um, um, by redesigning the body. I think it would be really interesting to have a map of the Laurentian body. He saw, for example, the, um, the, um, the unconscious was an organ for him, a physical organ like, like the kidneys, and it was placed behind the solar plexus. In fact, it was part of the solar plexus, which is an organ, which is part of the body no one thinks of anymore now. The lungs, which of course were what were, um, 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 what were, in, which were infected with um, tuberculosis for him. He saw as um, 
um, <laughs> destroyed by love. So he saw tuberculosis as being the pressure of a mother's love on the lungs. And wow. so the reason he couldn't breathe was because his mother had oppressed him. And it was so it's the heart pressing onto the lungs. It's absolutely bonkers. But it wasn't that bonkers because he was, I mean, quite a few theosophists believed in Lawrence's, Lawrence's version of the body. But by redesigning the body in the way that he did, he got around medical science. And so by coughing up blood, he didn't see this as a symbol of, you know, his imminent death. He saw it as probably as a symbol of being loved too much by his wife. Mm. So he managed to, um, he managed to kind of re, uh, completely dodge his death until he was on his deathbed. And just as he was dying in Vence in the south of France, um, aged 44 in 1930, his last letter to Aldous Huxley said, Huxley, this place is no good. He was planning to move on, to go back to America. So he just thought the more he moved, the yeah. faster he moved, the more, the higher the altitude he got, the um, longer he'd live. You're very good, I think, on ironies <laughs> in, in the story. And uh, you have a wonderful ending in terms of his ashes. Oh, the ashes, God, yes. Well, the, the book sort of began with this story about the ashes because I was told this extraordinary anecdote by a friend of mine. When I said to her, I'm, um, I'm writing about D.H. Lawrence, she said, did you know that they ate him? I said, well, who, no, who ate him? And she said, these three women in Taos, eight Lawrence, and what three women? I don't understand. And then she put me on to um, her sister-in-law who'd heard this story when she was traveling in um, Taos on the 80s, in the 80s, that, um, that Mabel Dodge Luhan and, and Frida and co had sat down and eaten Lawrence's ashes. And then I sort of, God, this is really extraordinary. And then started looking into this and realized that there were so many myths about the ashes, so many myths. And and um, Lawrence's ashes have been, um, Lawrence, Lawrence have been buried in Vance and then dug up under, um, 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 under uh, Frida's, um, um, Fried, because of Frida's wishes, burnt, the ashes carried to, carried to America where they've been lost several times en route. To <laughs> and then, then they'd been stolen well they were threatened to be stolen by Mabel Dodge Luhan who was also in love with Lawrence and so Frida said that she got her husband to stir them into the cement of the Lawrence Memorial Chapel which she may or may not have done because everyone else said that they satinate them which I think I think is very satisfying the thought of Lawrence being eaten I think going back into the body going back into the female body and that would have um, would have worked yeah. in, his, in his imagery. It would have worked very well. Well, it's a it's a wonderful ending to the book, and uh, I, I I I think this is a book that will last forever. I I think it's um, it's it's written with your passionate interest in the subject, so that um, you feel that. The story is completely fresh, and it's and it's fresh because you see it so freshly. Uh, it's a, it's a, a wonderful achievement, and a, I think a real. It's not that uh, any book is necessarily a model for other books, because uh, each book, like you said, you know, you you adopt a new voice and you you kind of start again. But it is terrific. And um, uh, one last question. I know we've got uh, questions that are going to come, but. Um, the women, I mean, he did draw quite a, <laughs> within the circle of hell, <laughs> he, he attracted uh, a, a number of women <laughs> who, who did adore him. I mean, who, and certainly um, you, you point out the number of people who, who seemed to, to kind of w want to be close to Lawrence in order to write about him. Mm. Now, was my, my it, it may be a silly question, but, you know, uh, were these people drawn to him? Because uh, I knew once many years ago, a lady in 
Greenwich, London, who, who, who'd met him when she was a teenager and she, she'd been visiting a friend in Highgate and he came into the room and she said he had a halo. Wow. She, 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 she just said he, I mean, you know, yes, she's impressionable adolescent, but she, she would never forget it. So for her, you know, he did carry that aura, if you like. But was that what uh, women were drawn to? Or, or was it his writing, which, you know, I never met him. So I just, I love his writing. Well, Frida certainly wouldn't have said he had a halo. Frida has <laughs> mocked Florence all the time. And she yeah. said, you know, call yourself a phoenix. You're more like an emu. <laughs> and um, so she, that relationship worked because she didn't take him seriously at all. But I think that other, yes, I think lots of other women, the women who flocked around Lawrence did see him as, um, um, as a kind of, as a mystical, semi-religious figure. And I think that, I think it has to be because, I mean, the appeal he had, had has to be because he was so untraditionally male. I mean, he had authority, but he also had this very, very deeply sensitive side. Remember, he was a man who was fantastically close to his mother mm. and who really talked to women. He really talked to them. And so the reason that his female characters live so much on the page is because he had such a searching relationship mm. with women. Because, not because he was interested in them, but because he was interested in writing well. His women are so much better than his men who are completely, completely wooden. Yeah. Because they're yeah. kind of hypothesized figures. But um, I can imagine, you know, if, if Lawrence were around now, I'd follow him and he'd loathe me because I'm not his type. But um... <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to comment on that. <laughs> we we I, do have several questions, if I may interject. Sure, Holly. And that segues quite nicely. I'm going to bounce around because a few of these are related. So I might hand you two at a time and you can take what you will. But to start with, um, especially pivoting from that point about how his women were much more developed as characters, sort of broad question to start. It says, can you tell us a little more about how you did the research for this book? You obviously read as many contemporary accounts as possible. Did you also do a lot of archive work and did you have access to any new info about DHL? And I'll just add one more um, that you could also incorporate. Uh, specifically, we got a question that said, your depiction of Mabel Dodge and her community in Taos was incredible. Was your main source for this, her book, Lorenzo in Taos? So just lots of questions about research there to start. Okay. No, that's an interesting question. All, um, it was in many ways an easy book to research because everything has been published. All of Lawrence's letters are, um, are already published and they've been very, very well edited. And also there have been such good biographies of Lawrence. And so um, I was very dependent on the three volume Cambridge biography of Lawrence for the facts and the dates for uh, just getting all the information in exactly the right order so, because what I wanted to do was a reinterpretation and so I wasn't looking for um, new material I was looking for a new way in to understand what it was like being Lawrence and what um, what I decided to do was to um, to research the book only by reading everything I could find by people who had met Lawrence. Mm. And so I didn't read any academic articles and I, I, I tried to keep it as unacademic as possible. But luckily, almost everyone who met Lawrence, even if they just met Lawrence for half an hour, wrote a memoir about it. Mm. And so there are about 30 of these accounts of meeting Lawrence. So I decided to home in on those and then to see what Lawrence had written about everyone that he met and then start a kind of start a conversation there. And yes, the great, the, Mabel, Mabel Dodge's Lawrence in um, um, Lorenzo in Taos is a superb book, I thought. It was just fascinating. I loved Mabel Dodge and what she wrote about Lawrence I thought was brilliant and what he wrote about her was unbelievably savage. But when, when, when you get into that stage, <laughs> stage of the story, it's kind of, um, you know, I was sort of levitating much of the time. But I found the research was, very dependent on something I call method biography, which I've never had to do before, but where I had to go to every place that Lawrence went to. 
in order for um, in order to write that scene. I'd never found this before with writing about Thomas de Quincey, for example, in my previous book, I just sat at my desk because mm -hmm. Lawrence de Quint Thomas de Quincey did everything on opium. And so there was all of his journeys were inward. And so I didn't need to, unless I'd written on opium, which I didn't, I need, didn't need to go where he went. But with Lawrence, I needed to go to every single house he'd lived in, in order to um, really soak up that experience, because his sense of place was mm. so preternatural. And also he lived in such God almighty shacks. I mean, it was just, he always described himself as living in great comfort, but you, he lived in, in tree yeah. houses on the top of the Rockies, you know, and, and needed to see this and also to get the sense of his journey up because his journey, his journey to paradise was very much a kind of um, vertical rise. And the more I traveled around the world looking at where Lawrence lived, the more my ears popped, you know, it was just the altitudes he ended up in was so extraordinary. So it was very much a kind of travel. It was a travel biography, which I wasn't planning on. I thought this was something I could write from my desk and then thought, oh, I can't, I can't. That's, that's why, uh, Francis, we have a travel scholarship at Bio. <laughs> Do you, especially for no, this, it's no, so I'm I, I'm really joking because it's a travel to the bio conference, but um, oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, there, there are examples in biography of writers who have slept on the. I'm sure Richard Holmes is one who slept on the graves of their authors. I, I admit, I've always rather mocked that, but I, you know, uh, I. Now I'm writing about Lincoln. I'm visiting all the Civil War battlefields and I do feel, um, I don't need it in terms of my describing the place, but I, I need it to help me understand the sort of something about, the, in my own mind, what happened there and the significance, yeah. yeah. It changes the atmosphere of the writing, Yeah, doesn't it, once you've been there. And I think it's important to, um, to know exactly what your subject knew and to see what they had seen. They wouldn't see it in the same way as you, but try to see it as mm. they saw it. And that feeds into the, um, into the fabric of the book and give, gives, it a, um, gives it a density, I think, that, which is important. Holly, to interject, know? yes, we do have a fellowship at Bio for travel more broadly for research. That's the sorry, yeah, Cairo fellowship. <laughs> Check out the website, all if you're interested. Another plug for our website. I do have several more questions. If we can try to squeeze some in, people are very fired up by this discussion. And let's take this one. We have several variations on this theme. I loved the way you brought in figures that aren't often included in Lawrence biographies. Was that part of your original plan or is that just how your project evolved? No, that was, uh, it was very much part of the original plan. That I wanted to, um, I wanted to flesh out characters who appeared in the official biographies just in a paragraph or two. For example, Morris Magnus, mm. who, um, Morris Magnus and Norman Douglas, who kind of star in the, in, in the middle section. I was fascinated by, by them, as you can tell, because I couldn't stop writing about them. But Morris Magnus, if he's mentioned at all in the other biographies, is a footnote. Mm. And when I started reading about him, I thought, God, this, this footnote is a novel. In fact, the whole book was going to be just about Lawrence and Morris Magnus because it was such a um, such a strange story and because Lawrence wrote the memoir of uh, Morris Magnus and it was the first kind of biographical writing that Lawrence had done and it was such an incredibly weird piece of biographical writing but very thrilling and I wanted to see what he would do with life writing and so it, so it started off looking at these bit players in Lawrence's life and fleshing them out and, and then I started getting interested in all the bit players like HD and um, and Mabel Dodge but I've always been interested in minor characters I think all the all the minor characters in Jane Austen are the best richest characters and the minor characters in Dickens are always the richest I I love the thought of um, um, of writing about writing a whole life just of minor people in people in the margins of someone's life. But Holly, could I just pick up on that, uh, Maurice Magnus? Because it, I, I think 
you know, the, like I say, when I went back to it, I thought, you know, this is so revealing about or surprising to some extent about Lawrence himself, because he's he he, he doesn't just take this relationship and then throw it away. Often he's uh, you know, pretty draconian in that way. But, you know, he's he he sticks around and he tries to help. And, and you know what? What was going on there in, do you think, in your mind? Uh, you know, is it that this was, Frida wasn't there? Uh, I mean, later. But, Frida was away, so Lawrence could play, yes. But yeah. you're absolutely right that this is, um, this was a reversal of Lawrence's normal relationship, because M Morris Magnus had no interest in Lawrence. It was Lawrence who pursued yeah. Lawrence. And so the the tables were turned here. Yes, exactly. And he was uh, he was fascinated by Magnus's homosexuality. He was a very camp man, Magnus. He was fascinated by it. And this was the first um, homosexual he'd met since Cambridge. Yeah. So he'd evolved from the man who kind of was left reeling seeing uh, um, seeing a gay man in Cambridge, and he now could not get enough of Morris Magnus's presence. And it was very exciting. I think for me, it was exciting that Frida wasn't there and you could look at what Lawrence might yeah. be like, a homosexual. Lawrence around the homosexuals rather than Lawrence being inside his marriage. Um, yeah. And this was, yeah, Lawrence being um, much, much more interested in someone than they were in him. Right. Was, was one off. Yeah, because he's always, as you say in the book, you know, everybody refers to, I think Frida once complains that um, everybody think, only ever calls him a genius, you know. <laughs> what about me? What about me? I'm a genius too. <laughs> yes. Or might they not say, well, he's an interesting man or he's, you know, that refer to, like you say, he was a great imitator and so forth. But it's, he's always has to be, a, oh, the, the genius Lawrence. And of course, you make a point... Yeah. As well, if I can, Holly, are we all right for time? I know there are. Yes, yes. Would, there are about two questions left if you can budget okay. that. <laughs> all right, I'll try and budget for that. But, you know, he, he's, um, you know, he's, he, he's, he went out of fashion. And, that, you know, another, to me, great quality of this book is that you've, I think, brought him back into fashion by looking into an aspect of his persona, his, his, his life as art, uh, with this sort of passionate curiosity. And um, so that even though he's by no means a, a modern man, <laughs> he nevertheless, the issues that he's dealing with and, and, and with Frida and whatever uh, are very much you know stories of our time and and in that sense he it it feels actuel and you think why isn't he why why is he rather forgotten yes it's yeah it's very strange isn't it the way that Lawrence comes into and out of focus and into and out of fashion because we can't actually get rid of him we keep no. <laughs> No, we keep censoring him, burning him, cancelling him, taking him off the syllabus, but everyone still heard of D.H. Lawrence and everyone still has a strong reaction to him. And I think that even if they've never read him, yeah. I think what's most fashionable about him now or what makes him most pertinent to readers now is what he says about the body. That when he said, I mean, for all his bonkers views about the body, he said a really intelligent thing, which was that the body has an intelligence. Mm. The body knows something. We live much more deeply and profoundly in our bodies than, um, than, than we'll acknowledge. And I think this is very much what um, younger generations, my daughter's generation, is trying to express now. You know, that our, um, our bodies have a life. Our bodies have their own sense of their, uh, of their gendered identity and we need to listen. We can't intellectualize everything. And I think Lawrence would have been completely on message mm. at the moment. Ironically, of course, as you say in the book, this was a man who hated to be touched. Hated yes. to have body touch. <laughs> For all I know. <laughs> Just so full of contradictions, but that is to me why it was his life is so fascinating. Holly, sorry, I'm. Can we... 
I don't blame you for taking the time. I think we can at least get one more in. So I'll act as if we only have time for one. I will try to preserve this chat. There's so much praise. It's a really, really lovely uh, dialogue going on here. But maybe to sort of round things out, we have a question. What draws you to writing biography, Francis? Do you have a future project in mind? Gosh, it's such a, I've thought about that so many years. I don't know, except that I knew from, um, I knew from the time I could first read that I only really wanted to read biographies and autobiographies. And I, you know, I read across, you know, I read novels and, and poetry too, but I was really fascinated, obsessively interested in life stories. And I think it was the combination of truth and art. I mm. love the fact that you could put, um, that you could deal with, um, you could deal with painful realities in a graceful way. Well, there just seemed to be something about the, um, the trickery of the form that, that fascinated me. And it comes very, very naturally. I'm much happier when I'm in a book, when I'm in a biography than I am when I'm not writing a biography. I think this is the case for all biographers that we feel happier living someone else's life. And in that sense, biographers have absolutely nothing in common with autobiographers who <laughs> live very intensely their own lives. I could never write an autobiography, but give me someone else's life to absorb myself in and I'll be and I'll be happily there for a decade. How very interesting, yeah. What's up? One more I'll, I'll try to sneak one in under the wire. It's a very good craft question. So we changed gears a bit. I'm sorry. We have a comment. I love the Dante imagery and references and structure as well. Thank you for sharing how you came to that from his writings. More specifically, were you working from the idea from the beginning of your drafting? Or were you drafting as you went along before you had figured out the structure and the imagery? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good honest question. No, the um I start the book began as a book about um Lawrence and Morris Magnus. I was just going to um I wanted to write entirely about Lawrence after the war, meeting this extraordinary man in Florence and what went on between them, this sort of black and white flickery jerky film relationship they had and then it evolved and I realized that, that the imagery was getting very very purgatorial and then and then the whole shape started to emerge so it was very um so it was very organic and um you said is it uh, there was no there's no drafting there was no drafting process really. I just started rewriting every day. <laughs> so every day I would erase what I'd done the day before and push it all in a different direction until I stopped. I mean, I, I think that's the way that computer writing works now. You know, you just kind of, um, um, you refresh, you rethink. It's like, it's very palimpsestic. But the... Uh... You know, the way you shaped it in the three sections and within those sections, the sort of chapters of, um, did, did that, did that happen organically as you were, as you were working yeah. on it? Or did you look back at the end and then say, here, I, this should be a new section or? Well, what I wanted was to um, have um, three books in a case. So I wanted it to look like the copy I have of, um, the, of the Divine Comedy, where it's three books in a little case. But my publishers didn't like that idea, and so understandably. And um, so they said, keep the three books in the same, um, in, um, within the same volume and try and blend them together more than you've already done because I wanted you know for us to net for there to be no mention of Morris Magnus ever again after purgatory mm -hmm. just got a new Lawrence in a new life so Lawrence in America bore no relation to Lawrence in Italy and Lawrence in Italy bore no relation to Lawrence in England because I was struck by the way that Lawrence was a different person in every country he reinvented himself all the time and then um thought that was kind of pushing it a bit so um because it what his life wasn't that episodic there was some fluidity mm -hmm. so um so the stories did tend to did blend into one another more than i'd initially planned 
Very but yes, I wanted it to be three and in, three independent studies of Lawrence. Well, Francis, I, I insist that I am allowed to do trilogies. <laughs> yeah. Much easier. Yeah. <laughs> no, yes. it's not easy. <laughs> Persuading them like it is really difficult. Trilogies how are we doing? I love, yeah. Holly, how are we doing? We've made it to the end. This has just been such a rich discussion. And thank you so much to both of you. I think everyone who's on and people have been in rapt attention here and have remained on, which is always a wonderful sign. But both people here and those who will see the recording later and the canines who have joined. Francis has one as well lurking. Very good addition. <laughs> but this is just so rich. Thank you both so much. This was such a wonderful discussion of craft. And thank, thank you, you for all your kind oh, words. Oh, n totally sincere and, and heartfelt, really. Just a wonderful, Beautiful. wonderful book. I'm going to hold it up just so that everybody can see. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Francis and Nigel. That was incredible. I took so many notes and you had so many gems. I love the idea of method biography in particular. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It's such interesting questions. All right. Well, I'll say goodbye. And um... <laughs> yeah. thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Okay.